Good morning. Welcome to our worship service this morning here at St. John's, and welcome to those who are joining us online as well. Before I go any further, just that reminder that I try to remember every, every Sunday, and that is to fill out a Connect card in your pew before you leave today. Also, if you're online, you can click on the menu and you'll find a Connect card to fill out there as well. Today we begin a new sermon series that will last for three weeks, and the series is entitled God's Words possess God's power. And that's what we will be focusing on for three weeks. And then each week there's kind of a sub-theme. And the sub-theme for today is, through his word, God crushes evil. And we might describe evil as anything that the devil would use to drive us away from God and to separate us from his blessings. And so through his word, God tells us the truth of who he is and who we are because of him and so crushes evil. That'll be our focus today. Everything that you need for worship should be on the screens, and we begin with our opening hymn. May the Lord bless our time together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this, I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me. 
a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to destroy the works of the devil and protect us poor people against such an evil foe. Uphold us in all affliction by your Holy Spirit so that we may have peace from such enemies and remain forever blessed. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 43, beginning at verse 8, where we see that God calls us to be witnesses to the truth that he alone is God and Savior. Lead out those who have eyes but are blind, who have ears but are deaf. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Which of their gods foretold this and pro proclaimed to us the former things? Let them bring in their witnesses to prove they were right, so that others may hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. I, even I, am the Lord, and apart from me, there is no Savior. I have revealed and saved and proclaimed. I am not some foreign God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, that I am God. Yes, and from ancient days I am he. No one can deliver out of my hand. When I act, who can reverse it? This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm for this morning.
Our second lesson for this morning is from Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 1, and this is the basis of the message today. I thank God, whom I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit, for the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand. Our gospel for this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, beginning at verse 26. And here Jesus demonstrates his power over evil. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him. And they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake, And was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon possessed man had been cured. And then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. 
So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We join in confessing our Christian faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated and we continue with our next hymn.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As I mentioned earlier, the message today is based on that second reading from 2 Timothy, and we begin with prayer. Lord, bless the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts. May they be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus, our Savior, the city was on fire. For five days, the flames raged. Half of the districts in the city were severely damaged, and 20% of them were completely destroyed. So the question was, was it an accident or was it arson? Eventually, a group was blamed for it a group that one historian described this way. They were hated for their abominations and for following a most mischievous superstition. Some of them pleaded guilty under torture. Others were gathered together just because they belonged to that, that hated group. The year was 54 AD. The city was Rome, and that hated group was known as Christians. And so the emperor Nero went into action and leaders of the Christian church were arrested and the apostle Peter was crucified, tradition says upside down, and the apostle Paul was put in prison. Perhaps now in his 60s, Paul was no stranger to prison. He had been arrested and imprisoned numerous times, but Now he knew this was going to be the last time. Soon he was going to bow his head to the executioner's sword. And it sure seemed like like evil was winning. But it was in that jail cell that Paul wrote his last letter that he wrote that's recorded in the New Testament, his letter to Timothy, who is a young man that Paul had, had mentored. He'd taken him from a mission trip companion and mentored him into a missionary himself, and now he was a pastor of a church in the city of Ephesus. And even though Timothy was a young man, he'd been a pastor long enough to experience the challenges that go along with the territory. And even though Timothy wasn't in a jail cell, he knew well how Satan uses evil from outside of the church and evil within the church to cause pastors and people to be quiet and attempt us to be timid. So what would Paul say? What would Paul say to encourage and to support his co-worker in the ministry who was going to carry on after Paul was gone? And what does he say to you and me who carry on today? Well, he said, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. In other words, keep on sharing what God has done for you and for everyone. Because as our sermon theme states, God's words possess God's power, and not just when they're spoken by him, but through us, his witnesses, as well. And it's through that word that he crushes evil. Timothy is listed as, as the recipient of this letter, but it wasn't just for him. He would certainly pass it on to his people, members of his congregation, and obviously we have it still today. So that original audience for this letter, they were Christians. And that means that the Holy Spirit had already worked inside of them. The Holy Spirit had, had already caused them to know certain things like that they were sinners before God. It meant that they they knew what they deserved for that, that they deserved condemnation, and they deserved separation from God. They knew that clearly. But there's something else that they knew. They knew that God had sent a Savior. And they knew by the power of the Holy Spirit that that Savior from sin had rescued them from everything, all of what they truly deserved. And so now they knew that they stood before God as dearly loved children. 
In other words, they knew what you know. And so I can say to you what Paul said to them. I can't thank God enough for what he's done for you. I am grateful for the faith that you have. In whatever way that God brought the good news of Jesus to you to make that happen, whether it was through family or friends or pastors or teachers, there's faith in Jesus in you. And I thank God that there is. And Paul adds an additional thought before he wasn't going to be there to encourage these Christians anymore in their faith. He said, don't be complacent and don't be fearful, you children of God. Don't be complacent. Don't be fearful. God didn't give you a living faith in Jesus so that you could just keep it to yourself. And I know how easy it is to get lost in our own little worlds, in our own pursuits, and just getting so busy with our own personal plans and we forget that God has something so much better in mind for you and me. Anybody know what this is? Anybody? Okay. A bellows. Does anyone have a bellows in their home? Okay, awesome. Yeah, a bellows, it, it looks a little bit like an accordion, and it has a nozzle on the end, and you squeeze it together, and it pushes air out, and is used to get and to keep a fire going. And Paul says here, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. You have faith from God. And you have gifts from God that he wants you to use in service to others. So light them up. God hasn't given us a license to be lazy. And he hasn't converted us to be quiet. We are his children, born again to be bold. And one final encouragement that Paul gives, he knew that he soon was going to be gone, but there was something that needed and must go on. Something that is worth working hard for, something that's worth being committed to, something worth contributing to and, and praying for, a cause that was worth suffering for, a mission that was worth dying for, sharing the good news of God. His love for you in Christ. And how could that love of God for you appear any more undeserved than when you put it on a timeline, as Paul kind of does here? He saved us and called us to a holy life, one that was set apart by him and for him. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus. Long before the day of your birth, before this church ever existed, before Jesus was born, before God brought Eve to Adam and united them together in marriage, before all of that, the timeless and the eternal God gave you his undeserved love. And that puts earning or deserving God's love and favor completely out of the realm of possibility. It is simply a gift that he has freely given to you and to me. So what in the world was he thinking doing that? <laughs> Couldn't he see the sinners that we would be? Yes, he could, and, and yes, he did. But he also saw the Savior, his son, would be. And in time, and according to his plan, he's let you see it too. In a place called Bethlehem, in a town called Nazareth, in villages around the Sea of Galilee. And he's let you see his son riding on a donkey into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and on trial on Holy Thursday and on a cross 
on Good Friday and on a victory lap on Easter Sunday. And all of that was done for you and for me. And we didn't deserve any of it. And that's what gives us peace in knowing that we're forgiven. That's what gives us joy in knowing that we are loved by God always. That's what gives us contentment, knowing that we live under his care. But it doesn't stop there. One of the things that we deserve for our sins that the Bible makes very clear is death. And what did Jesus do about that? Christ Jesus destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So in Jesus, you will not die. Don't worry about what your mind tells you when your eyes see a cemetery or a casket or an urn. Put all of your reason aside and and turn up your ears and listen. That because Jesus died in your place and came to life again and now he lives and reigns eternally, you will not die In Christ Jesus, the moment of your physical death becomes the beginning of your life with God in heaven that will never, ever end. At the beginning of this letter, Paul called it the promise of the life that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul knew that it was life a life that not even an executioner's sword could end. And when you know that you deserve the opposite, Grace and mercy and peace have been given to you along with immortality. And God says, I want you to give that to other people because I want way more people than you to have the life that I give. And we see an excellent example of how he does that in our gospel reading. It's kind of a crazy reading, wasn't it? with the demon-possessed man and, and really, really possessed. But Jesus, just using his word, demonstrated his power over the devil as he restored this man. He, he, he healed him from demon possession. And then, then he left him, not only restored, but he left him with a mission and with a purpose, right? I want you to stay here, and I want you to tell people how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. And the next time Jesus went to that region, that place where people said, get out of here, we're afraid, they flocked to him. And it tells us that Jesus' words possess Jesus' power even when they don't come from his mouth. Jesus puts his word on your lips and he makes us his witnesses, and when we carry out that awesome role, Jesus continues to drive back the devil and his allies just as he did when he walked on this earth. And so Paul says, no matter what it costs you, even if it costs you everything, never think for a minute that sharing the gospel isn't worth it. So do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord. Join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. I'm grateful for the faith that you have, and I'm reminding you of the power that God has through his word. People may think what they will and say what they will and do what they will, and they will, from making fun of you all the way to to wanting to just get, get rid of you. But none of that can loosen the hold that Jesus has on you through his word. And nothing and no one is more powerful than he. Last week in the early service, we had the privilege of witnessing one of our young gals, Maya, be confirmed. If you were here in that first service, you saw that, and she came up front and and as you maybe did when you were confirmed, you're, you're given an opportunity to confess your faith in the presence of God and your family and, and this congregation. And so you're asked a series of questions. And, and her initial answers were a series of I 
dues to what she believed regarding God. And then comes that last question. Is it your sincere prayer and desire to live a life that pleases God, to value his word and sacrament, and to witness to your Savior wherever you go? And she answered, yes, and I ask God to help me. Biblical directives like we have in our reading today for pastors and for people sometimes can seem a bit overwhelming, can't they? And left to ourselves and to our own power, we can never be the people that God has called us to be. And so we too say, yes, and I ask God to help me which is exactly what we did earlier in the service when we prayed that God would protect us poor people. Did you catch that? Us poor people from the devil, our evil foe. And he does. As he comes to us through his word, his powerful word, and through his sacrament, where he always meets our failure with his forgiveness and greets our guilt with his grace, so that we might be strong in his strength, and we might be loving because of his love, and we might be faithful because of his faithfulness, and not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, because we know that God's words possess God's power, and through that word, he crushes evil. Amen. We continue now with the prayer of the church. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for all your mercies, especially for the gift of your Son, through whom you have revealed your gracious will. We praise you for the Holy Spirit and his working through the means of grace. Plant your word in our hearts and cause it to produce fruit in our lives. Lord, we ask you to bless Pastor Bryant Laude as he deliberates the call that we have given him to serve as the associate pastor here at St. John's. Help him to have meaningful conversations with the leaders here at St. John's and also the leaders at his church in Mobird, South Dakota, and bring him to a clear conviction as where you would have him serve at this time. Strengthen and defend your church that by your word and sacraments, faith may grow and love toward all may increase. Support all who spread the light of your truth throughout the world. Keep our children in the grace of their baptisms. Enable their parents to train them in lives of faith. Raise up Christians to serve you in the ministry of the word and in all godly walks of life. Preserve our nation in justice and honor. Guide and bless all who make and administer and judge our laws. Give them wisdom that they may promote justice and hinder evil. Let your blessing rest on planting and harvest, commerce and industry, medicine and science, the arts and culture. Protect all who travel and care for those whose work is difficult or dangerous. Be with all who devote themselves to any useful task. Comfort all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Especially this morning, we remember before you Nancy Olson, who has a medical procedure tomorrow, and also Linda Catroa's father, Don Ost, who continues to recover from surgery. We also ask you to be with uh, Terry Krause's family because of the death of his mother, and also with Ann Rust and her family because of the death of her mother as well. Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence.
we remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in the true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Today we celebrate your gift of fathers. In your wisdom, you give them the responsibility to be heads over their families. Strengthen and encourage fathers everywhere through your word to carry out this important calling. Use them to bring their families to your feet where they can hear of your love and power. And bless them as they share your word and bring up our children to know and love Jesus as their Savior and to serve and love others in Christian joy. Today we also commemorate the liberation of enslaved people in our country. Grant us grace to contend fearlessly against evil and to make no peace with oppression. Help us, like those generations before us who resisted the evil of slavery and human bondage in any form and any manner of oppression. Help us to use our freedoms to bring justice among people and nations everywhere to the glory of your holy name. Grant these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should give thanks to you, Almighty Father, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who promised that wherever two or three come together in his name, there he is with them to shepherd his flock until he comes again in glory. And therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. This true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, which you have received in this sacrament, strengthens you and keeps you in the one true faith to life everlasting. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. Good morning. Once again, thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Uh, And if you haven't had a chance to fill out the Connect card yet, um, please do that both online and here in person as well. A reminder that we have a voters meeting scheduled this morning between the services. It'll start uh, in about 20 minutes or so, around 930. Um, And we are voting on the church budget for this next year. Um, So an important voters meeting. So hopefully you can attend that. And then um, maybe only one announcement would be um, that the Grief Share group met for the first time this past Wednesday. And that was really, it was a really good thing. Uh, People were able to share their stories and um, give comfort to one another. And uh, they'll continue to be doing this um, every Wednesday for several weeks. If you intended to come to that or somebody you know intended to come to that and couldn't make it, you can still uh, come again on this Wednesday. And we've, we have the videos that we watch um, recorded so that we can let you see that on your own as well. I think that's all I have for this morning. May the Lord bless you this week of his grace. <laughs>